Right. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for turning up for this and um, giving it a go. It, it's slightly free form what we're thinking of doing. Um, uh, I'm going to start with a short uh, bit about thinking and um, just sort of set the scene and then Mark's going to come up and follow that up with a quick chat and then Rob's going to try and explain what we want you to do um, because this is a collective endeavour. Um, but I suppose I want to start um, by really just talking about um, the theme of the conference. I mean, it's something I believe in passionately. Um, I absolutely believe heritage and archaeology are a shared endeavour, owned and to be explored by everyone. I believe in the possibilities uh, presented to us by archaeology and heritage, and those possibilities to influence and change people's lives. Simply put, I believe in open archaeology. Archaeology open to all, owned by all, for all of us, um, and uh, to be done by all of us. Yeah, I'm also struck by how our processes and practices are very inward focused. And this is epitomised by the very definition of archaeological interest in the MPPF. There will be archaeological interest in a heritage asset if it holds or potentially holds evidence of past human activity worthy of expert investigation at some point. Experts and expertise figure strongly in, in, our, in our language. Uh, but we've recognised we want to let others in. But what also strikes me as interesting is when we allow non-experts to enter our world, we describe it as outreach or community archaeology, as if it's something lesser and in need of separation from our more considered and expert approach. Now, I, this isn't actually where archaeology came from. Archaeology came from voluntary exploration. Archaeologists came from... Uh, archaeology came from everywhere. And I think a sort of expert-led approach actually fundamentally limits and restricts our vision and our ability to see the bigger picture, and therefore our ability to maximise the impact of our interventions and the legacy of our work. I think we're constricting ourselves at our own peril. But I'm also really interested in finding out what we're missing. What are the skills, the attributes, what's the knowledge, the approaches for gaining knowledge? Um, are, what are these th things that we're missing? What, what do we need uh, to consider when exploring questions around impact, legacy, benefit and value? And when we think about them, how might we then maximise them? How might we do better, do more of it, um, as, so that we can, we can reach out even more? For me, I'm not talking about professional standards here or professional practice. Um, I'm not talking about professional qualifications or our IQ. Yes, all those things are important. Okay. It's, um, but I want, there's something else I think we need to start understanding and grasping. Indeed, it's not even about our level of accreditation or if we've achieved a leadership role uh, or, or a management role. To me, it's something more comprehensive about the approach to what the approaches we want to take to our work. For me, it's, it's fundamentally about how we want to relate to and communicate to people um, both professional and non-professional, academic or amateur, um, the subjects that we're actually interested in. It's, it's also about exploring with them the subjects they're interested in. It, it's, it's a two-way conversation, yet often we always present it as a one-way road, our knowledge becoming their knowledge. To me, then, it's actually about our emotional intelligence. Where, where do we think we are in terms of how we apply our human behaviours to the problems that we see in front of us and our work. To me, it's about understanding that anyone can lead in this subject. Anyone can offer leadership and inspiration uh, to the work we actually do. And once you understand that, we can understand that everyone can have an impact and everyone can leave a lasting legacy. We just need to be much better at empowering people to do so. So again, if we think we're in leadership roles, 
our main aim is to empower people to actually be able to express themselves and be able to actually take this more open approach. Now at TAG this year, I was involved in a session exploring expertise. And this is an often used concept to justify our existence. As expert archaeologists, we justify our right to keep digging. Indeed, in my role as a principal inspector of ancient monuments with Historic England, I am asked to identify myself as an expert. In our last restructure in 2012, when I was appointed to this post, I actually had to submit a statement of expertise in 100 words. It didn't do very well. I only got two out of five. Currently, we, Historic England, define our role as the government's expert advisors on the historic environment. And it is used to justify our, as in our organisational, existence and in part to maintain our funding. Now, as an organisational decision, I'm actually fine with this. Um, you know, it's a really pragmatic decision for me. I can understand it. Indeed, my job and my own livelihood depend on it being successful because I like to carry on working for my organisation. But what about this in terms of me as an individual, uh, me as a heritage uh, practitioner? If I believe in a non-authorised heritage discourse, which I do, if I believe archaeology is a process and not a thing or a product, which I do, if the stuff in the ground is just stuff in the ground until we ascribe it different values and call it archaeology, which it is, how do I have an impact? How do I approach my work to widen its scope, its benefit and its value? How do I look to create lasting legacies? Now, within this, I'm very well aware that um, in being identified as an expert, to have expertise in archaeology and the historic environment, actually adds weight and, dare I say it, authority to the advice and decisions I make. It also cuts across the inclusive and democratic approach the heritage I believe in. So how might I reconcile these conflicts? Well, as in most of my life now, I, I, I look to outside influences to try and help me and help my brain work. And in this instance, I'm actually going to look towards the movie Ratatouille and the story of a chef, a rat and a critic. Award-winning chef Gusto maintains anyone can cook. Critic Anton Egon pours scorn on this idea until he is cooked a meal by Remé, a rat. It is at this point Anton Ego understands what Chef Gusto meant. Whilst not everyone can become a great artist, a great artist might come from anywhere. Now, this is a really good analogy for archaeology and heritage. So whilst not everyone might become a great archaeologist, a great archaeologist might come from anywhere. How do we find this? But I'd also like to add my own perspective on this and my own interpretation uh, on, uh, on this idea. And I would say, whilst not everyone might become a great chef, Everybody can actually have a go at cooking. So whilst not everyone might become a professional expert archaeologist, a great archaeologist, anyone can have a go at it, anyone can participate, and anyone can help define it. Indeed, in terms of the rat ratatouille, not only was the chef, René the rat, different, but the food he produced was different too. Who did the cooking changed, and so did the content of what was cooked. Imagine that in archaeology. By letting people in, we might actually create a better output. There also seems to be a more fundamental shift in how we understand our role and profession here, in that heritage is a collaborative process. It's a process that needs different ways of knowing and different ways of doing. Formal research-based knowledge is an important part, but only one part of our recipe. Yes, I know, I'm refer returning to the metaphor. But more than that, doing it collaboratively with people means heritage is different. It's richer, it's more dynamic, it's more sustainable. But also I need to challenge this, because in my Ratatouille formula, there is still, objectively, a great cook. 
It's just that anyone can be one. And that the critic, I an expert, like me, still defines what a great cook might be. Now this is a role I'm often, and many of us are, often asked to play. But it's actually a role I really always want to challenge. And I want to challenge whether actually being a great cook is more important than just cooking, i.e. doing it, having a go. We've all got to eat to live. Understanding this par paradox, great cook versus cooking, helps me reconcile the conflict. Uh, uh, the conflict I have of being identified as an expert, and it helps me work to a more democratic and inclusive heritage discourse and practice. To me, expertise is a combination of knowledge and skills. They form a philosophical framework in which I try and work, and it is this approach that allows me to open up what I do for others. This is important to understand. What this orientation to an expertise enables me to do in terms of democratising heritage. But best of all with this approach is we all have the power to add to our knowledge. And I really hope mine will always be incomplete. I want to learn more. I want to always be curious, inquisitive, creative. I want to listen to others, to hear their stories. How I use this knowledge I gain, how I apply it, are my skills. And yes, whilst I do hope I'm good at what I, uh, I do, I can always do it differently. I hope I can always do it better, listen better, seek to improve my skills. But in this sense, I actually want to be work in progress to the day I die. So actually to define me as an expert is really problematic because I'm not. I actually don't know everything. So again, if you really want to define me as an expert, I will accept it, but I will say it's a sense of me being incomplete, and I will actually look anywhere to help me seek and gain knowledge, and I will consistently seek to improve the skills I have. Now, I, I feel comfortable in this. I have a philosophical framework that adapts to circumstance, people and places, and constantly draws upon my experiences. It's open and it's simple, okay? And I can define it three ways. It's about inquisitiveness. It's about the thirst to ask questions. It's about curiosity, the desire to seek out knowledge. And it's about creativity, the passion to apply my knowledge and apply my skills, hopefully for the benefit of others, so they might draw meaning and inspiration from it. And also so that I can actually reflect back what they might be interested in and what they might be listening to. Now, when you look at our subject this way around, it also introduces another critical aspect of how we approach our work. It's not all about our IQ. It's actually about our EI, sorry, our EQI, our emotional intelligence, the capacity to be aware and control our emotions, to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. Emotional intelligence is the key to both personal and professional success. And to me, I think this is the biggest challenge in archaeology. We just don't understand it in the context of emotional intelligence. I was on a training course a couple of weeks ago um, about leadership, and emotional intelligence came up. And we were told this about it. The average job, it is said, 66% of our success is down to EIQ, i.e. emotional intelligence. 33% of success is down to our base IQ. However, in leadership roles, this changes to 85% for EQI and 15% for IQ. Now, to me, if we actually want to lead in this discipline, if we want to lead in this subject, if we want to be more inclusive and more open, it's blatantly obvious where we need to be concentrating our energies and our thought processes and our training. It's on our emotional intelligence. It's how do we transfer on the rest of our knowledge and skills. So as I said earlier, everyone can lead, and I passionately believe everyone in this room is a leader. Then, if that's the case, we should really focus on this emotional intelligence question. To me, it's the key to archaeology and heritage delivering a more open and inclusive approach but one that truly catches the theme of this conference. 
value, benefit, impact, and legacy. And it is this issue, it's emotional intelligence, those aspects, those facets of it that I really want us to explore. Uh, just, sorry. Uh, that's a, that, that's worked well, hasn't it? Uh, that was supposed to be a really good slide showing the 85%, but I will just uh, skip over that one. Okay, so it's this, it's, this, it's this aspect that I really want us to explore, and then we, we're looking at this in, in the session about what makes the ideal archaeologist, okay, from the perspective uh, of, of, of the conference themes. And um, this has been a conversation that um, I've been having with Rob Lennox and Mark Spanier, and one of the things we just wanted to do was almost just sort of create it into a, into a conversation. So what I'm, I'm going to do now is I'm, that that's all I want to say at this point. We are going to have a really open and discursive session later. But what I really want to do now is just oh, this is why I forgot it actually had animations. So those three percent IQ, see how good I am, can't you? Six things, all kinds of jobs and leadership roles. Eighty-five percent EQ. Okay. But what I really want to do now is just ask Mark to come up to the stage and effectively lead you through a chat. Now, Mark specifically asked not to frame this in any way. Um, and the only thing I wanted to say about it is Mark is going to express one of my uh, emotional uh, requirements for us that I think is a really good one, which is spontaneity. So, Mark, over to you. Imagine there are five or six of us in the boat round a table. Yes, I know it's a bit difficult. If you don't like the metaphor of the pub and you're not into pub culture, let's say this is one of these summer nights. You have the, the hefty part of the party is gone. There is small campfire there. The sun is going down. You're mellow. And you are getting into touch with who you think you are. You are experiencing life. And there is a campfire there, so take the edge of the... And it's, well, it's not too high, so you can see and you can speak. Again, five to six people. So I'm asking you to sort of remove, put yourself in the center and remove quite a lot of people around you. And I would be there, you would be there. Rob would probably be somewhere else uh, behind us doing the same thing. But, uh, and uh, so there we are. And the question which comes up is, uh, oh, what, what are you doing? What is important in your life and that kind of thing. And I would probably begin by telling you, seven years ago, I became ill. Not a good start or story. But, uh, I was sitting behind my desk being an expert, being a successful archaeologist. I even got a car from which I could use from the company. It was reasonably well paid. First edge of the crisis was there. And I was hit by a truck. It's called a burnout. And if you think that burnouts are sort of lovely kind of, oh, you sort of retreat, I was physically unable. It was there, and mail comes in, I think I have to react. And from that moment on, I can almost point to the second exactly, I was not able to touch my computer. I could not even push the on and off button. And I being in control. I'm being rational, I'm an expert, I'm a project manager. At that stage, I even could be called the head of archaeology in Europe for Arcadis. Hooray. So I was, all the titles were there. So I went to my, my doctor and I said, uh, well, I've been through this process with others, so I do this and this and this and this. So I was in charge, being rational about it. Okay. Sounds good, Mark. You go. And I go back to the office and do my half an hour thing. I didn't was able to do half a day of work, uh, being in the office alone, and then I was hit again. My body told me essentially, shut up, Mark. We warned you kindly for many times, we warned you a bit harder, now we're going to, uh, we'll really make you suffer. And you're lay there laying in your bed, and you're thinking, where's my life? I couldn't think about that at And then you start sort of, well, building yourself together. It's called therapy. And of course, I was one of these brothers who didn't fit into the normal pieces of therapy. So they sort of think, well, just Mark must have chats. Every week, Mark comes along and have a chat. And then slowly, you start to, to, to tell you yourself that you're not happy with archaeology. It's not only archaeology. Let's be honest, I've 
my wife was ill, uh, mom and dad died, uh, all kinds of things. So, but in the mix, the one thing you think is keeping yourself up, which is your, your love and attention to, to our biology, is failing. And you are getting sort of angry with our biology. Giving it all, and you've been responsible for the good of the public, etc., etc. Of course, you were paid for it, and and you are thinking, is this all? It's called a classic midlife crisis. There was a distinct lack of motorcycles. <laughs> I didn't run away from my wife with a younger woman or whatever, or man or whatever, whichever your taste is. Uh, but it was a classic burnout. And then you start sort of thinking. And I'm teaching as well, yeah, a bit more now than I was then. And then I realized the burnout's getting sooner and sooner. I'm teaching that a lot of my students, and I will not get numbers on it, but a lot of my students have had a burnout before they come to university. A lot of my younger colleagues, 10 years, 20 years younger than I, archaeologists, good archaeologists, are having burnouts. They cannot perform the thing they love. What's happening to us? And at the same time, you will, then you do the uh, <clears throat> you do the right thing. You become a member of this institute. You tick all the boxes. You are responsible. But what is in it for you? What is the legacy you're building for yourself? What is your your social and emotionally investment? Well, you're sort of on demand. And then you go to. Uh, uh, to CIFA in, in Cardiff, it was, if I say it right, three years ago, four years ago. And you go to the session on the glass ceiling, as it was called. And female archaeologists told us, it was before the Me Too thing, what happened to them on, on the basis of mistrust, not being able to work in archaeology, sexual harassment. I, I never even had to that point thought that. That would be possible in archaeology. I had a very rosy, tinted idea of, oh, we archaeologists, we are sort of the good guys. No harm will be found. We will walk hand in hand into the sunshine and it will be lovely. It was not. I had to force myself physically to go back into that session. I knew I couldn't walk away from it, but I was physically ill that day. That was not the archaeology I wanted to be in. And at the same time, the amount of people telling me, knowing that I was ill, that they were unhappy in archaeology was growing. So what do you do about it? You cannot really change yourself, so I was getting thinking leadership from whatever thing. So you start discussing this, and you're thinking, what's the solution? And you, the first instant is, uh, let's call revolution. Eh? We, we, all, we burn the whole stuff and we do something different. Well, that's not very realistic. Uh, Will not happen. But you're thinking, what, was, what's the word? what makes me happy? And some of you can't even remember the, the last days. Two years ago, I, I went out on a limb and I, I had this whole idea of the archaeology of happiness. What makes us happy? And who will let us make ourselves happy? Who's going to pay that for me to have a jolly good time? Who is going to allow me to have fun? to emotionally attach to these things. And it is, and then you realize that is who we have always been. It took me two years in therapy before the most obvious thing someone ever told me is, Mark, this storytelling you're always harking about, eh? what is it for you? And I said, well, this is sort of an appendix. I can, I can do without it, and uh, it's painful probably to, to get it out, but uh, yeah, it's sort of a nice add-on, sort of a source on, on all the things I do. And then uh, your therapist, he had a sort of get a, a grip on me, and she looked at me and said, is that really true? And then, then I repeated this in a different form, and suddenly it hit me. It took me more than 40 years to realize that storytelling is the core of my being. And I was being serious, and I arranged things, and I was a good project manager. But in heart, in essence, from as long as I remember, since the age of 10 or earlier, I have been telling stories. And then you're thinking back, and I said, 
and you realize 15 years ago, I'm, I'm one of these, these relics here who come here. I've been here for the last 18 years. And 15 years ago, we were discussing in a bigger room than this, what is it to be an archaeologist? And there were all great kinds of definitions. There was this whole togetherness there. And I had the temerity then to stand up for the first time when, well, my English was quite good, but not that good to express. And I said, but in the core, are we not storytellers? And it was shouted down. There was a sort of almost physical <coughs> revulsion in the, 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 at that time of, no, no, Mark. It was li literally said, uh, that's not who we are. We are much more. We, and then the whole list comes. You know the list. And, it's, uh, and I do believe in the list. Helpful archaeologist sort of in afterwards came to me and sort of explained that we were much more. Oh, no, it was not that simple a story. Then. If we ask the question now, 15 years old, and say, oh, what's the core being of an archaeologist? <coughs> Push, the world has turned. Almost everyone says story time. That's strange. Nothing ever changes in archaeology. Fifty years ago we thought that is not that is big. And now we are selling that's the core of a being. But then I realized that storytelling that oh it's fine by me. I'm a winner again. I'm a storyteller, so therefore storytelling is important. So one plus one makes four or six or even eight. So hooray, I'm saved again. But a lot of people in our profession are bloody scared of this storytelling thing. Suddenly they have to do things where which they're not trained. Suddenly they have to be on a different footing. Suddenly they have to be in surroundings where they're not in command of things. Suddenly they invite comments and that kind of thing. That's scary shit. Suddenly you are vulnerable, especially if you're not trained to do this kind of thing. So I could call the new dictatorship the quote of my earlier session uh, in this conference, and, and say, this is the time of the story time. Who doesn't like it go away? No. This is the time of engagement. This is the time of understanding who we are. This is the time of empathy. A good storyteller, a good storyteller feels his public. That's the reason why I have the metaphor and the idea of having five or six people. That's almost the right audience. You cannot do it constantly with five or six people. Then I would stay a long time in Leeds, which is a lovely city, but that having these session storytelling to you all the same story is a bit of a hardship. <laughs> I'm here on my own time, so um, well, perhaps a good idea for a holiday. But maybe not, maybe not. Let's, let's not go there. Um, that, so that's the quality, empathy. Allowing other people in. Doing something different. And I remember that I like these things. Sometimes people say, oh, nobody loves us. That's, that's so much untrue. Even if people have now had very bad work relations, loved working with an they will not confess to it. It has been told to me when I was looking straight there. Someone else next to me was standing there, also straight looking at me, even, even after 10 weeks of fight to look at each other. But the only thing the guy said to me was, you cannot quote on me, but it is the best time I've ever had on the job. So, <laughs> what the fuck happened there? <laughs> it is, it is much more, it is making sense of the world. There are a lot of people there who think there is no ownership of, of the past, of their ideas, or, and we should be guides, we should be helping them, not agreeing with them. If you people say, yeah, you should listen to, well, or something far extreme right wing on whatever front, that doesn't mean that you sort of say, oh yeah, you're right, no, you should listen to them and, and, and ask and see what, what's helpful for them, what drives them. We tell everyone that we think humans are interesting, and I think you're... Also, if the human is not archaeological trained. One of the loveliest experiences I had was with an amateur archaeologist who had a great fondness for uh, Neolithic pottery, especially for a small finds group in the middle of the Netherlands. And he always explained it to me, if the other archaeologist said, uh, amateurs uh, let me, 
they always came to me when I wanted to talk to him and he said, Mark, don't take him too serious. No, he's, we're not like him. And it was quite obvious why they didn't take him very serious, because he made these lovely pots, this big Neolithic stone Laren culture or Hilson culture. Not that I like these pots, but I like what he did with them. And what he did with them was, oh, Mark, these pots will sort of collapse if you don't help them up. And the answer is chicken wire. And everyone thought him was a loon, but there was seldom anyone so harmless and so enjoying the archaeology mass with this guy who made lovely copies of his pot with chicken. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed being arrested by Dutch police by, for breaking the monument law. That could be a scary thing. Well, I was in the right, I had lovely talks with all kinds of people and I explained the law to them. That's a good moment in your, in your career. <laughs> and you have to explain them to the police what the law is. That's, that's adding value. <laughs> it's fun. <coughs> that's not fun for all of you, but it is fun. It is engagement. I don't mind if people, especially in an urban site, and I hate these, these skills or whatever, I like the nonsense being thrown at me. So many people think that Christian is bad at it. People ask him, did you find gold? And my standard answer is, yes, and it's now in my pocket. <laughs> and having a sense of fun, having engagement, being part of an organism bigger as, that is what it brings us, an honest interest in other fellow human beings. That is what will make us free, in a sense. Why will it make us free? Because everyone likes to have a good time. Everyone wants to be part of the fun group. And what's the fun group? Well, the people who at least are saying that they're fun. And you can have a bloody fun time doing that with you. Especially when you share it. When are we the most happy? I've told before. When we are in a group around this campfire or in the pub or whatever. And, and telling, telling the stories. We're not talking about it. Did you see this this housing thing there? No, that, that's the early part of the evening. And then we sort of tell all the wonderful things we found. But then the stories come. Our subculture. And the most important thing we can give to a lot of people outside of our culture is letting them in. And I was sort of preparing this, uh, preparing in the time that I thought I would prepare this and I have something the classic thing. There's a reason why I decided to sit down here. I could stand there, but then the narrative changes. I would love me to have been sitting there with my knees over it, but then they cannot see me. I truly want to have a closer engagement with you. You have been very kindly listening to me, but I, there is this, this hope in me that someone will raise a hand somewhere in the middle of my book and say, Mark, you're sprouting utter nonsense, or you can tell <laughs> a bit more about that, or engagement. And then I realized, when was I the most happy in archaeology? Uh, and it was probably, probably when one of these cars, I had these lovely Ford Chesta sports ones, which I had a few well, tickets and some nice conversations with the police. Ah, my, my juvenile part of being a driver, let's say. And in that car, I had one of the best times ever. And I was sitting there with my colleague, Jan Bresser. And nobody here knows the, young, the name of Jan Bresser, and I can even tell you, you cannot find him on the internet. And probably in, at that stage, I'm talking 15 years ago, he could not have made a practitioner uh, grade of this institute, in the way things were there. But Jan enjoyed being with archaeologists. Jan was this ridiculous figure in the sense, in the kindest sense of the word, that could have lived from his art. If Jan wanted to have money, he went in the weekend to his atelier, which was just a shed, and he splashed some things there, and then he found someone, and they gave him a few hundred euros or whatever, or gilders at the stage. He could have made much more money doing archaeology. He wanted to be with archaeology. And he had an emotional attachment to it. And I sat there in this car, and it rained, and it rained, and it poured. And you, yeah, I have this first year thinking, oh gosh, where's my time going? Oh, I have to finish this. I cannot see anything. So, oh, 
it's all bad, it's all bad. And then, yeah, in the end you cannot for hours and hours stay thinking about how bad it is, so you get in a sort of an acceptance mode. Then you get to the, to the mellow stage. And then you talk about with Jan about the law of activity. What drives him? What makes him tick? Why for all these years he was he's there, he could have been a great artist. Why was he around us? Why was he not earning three times as much money? Why was he so satisfied? And the only, only time I walked away from a decision as an archaeologist was when I was sent out by the nobody there to say to Jan, we will not hand draw pictures anymore. We will not hand color them anymore. And I, I was sent out to do the dirty work. I felt like a sort of a mafia hitman. So I went down there and I said, Jan, I'm very sorry this is over. And he had this drawing there, these, these big Dutch style A0 things, and totally hand poured, and he could do less the best. And it looked wonderful. And he stood next to me and he, it was as if I, I hit a dog or something, something like that. He sort of totally crumpled. And then he only said, but there's such beauty there. And I collapsed, mentally. And I said, yep, you're right, go on. And I went back to uh, the people who sent me and I said, I cannot do it, do it yourself. And Jan colored to the end, very inefficiently, very non-commercial archaeology. And if I had a chance to sort of rip out one of his drawings from the National Archives, I would do it. There's beauty in, in our profession. There's beauty in the meeting of other people. And there is lots to gain if we are able to, well, connect with the emotional side of things. You can be unhappy in archaeology, but you can also connect to the things which make your heart sing. And I advise anyone to go on the journey and sort of form archaeology towards a, a happier place for all.